Hello, I'm Travis Block, Senior Scientist at Stembiosis, and thank you for joining me for this discussion on the development and applications of cell-derived extracellular matrices. At Stembiosis, we're using extracellular matrix technology to address really fundamental problems with cell culture. And so the key issue is this. Uh, current cell culture methods are really philosophically flawed. Traditionally, uh, tissue is taken from an organism. That tissue is then either enzymatically digested or physically disrupted in order to isolate cells of interest. And then those cells are placed onto some sort of tissue culture dish. Now, what's wrong with this system? The problem is that these cells are being removed from an environment that's signal rich. So they reside in a native niche that's full of biochemical, structural and mechanical signals that are cueing these cells and dictating their behavior. And they're being removed from that environment and they're being put into a, a relatively simple substrate. Whether this is tissue culture plastic or a fibronectin, laminin, major gel coated dish, it's really failing to recreate the complexity of the native niche. And our philosophy at Stembiosis is that we can expect cells to respond just as strongly to signals that they should receive and don't as any signals that they do receive. And so we can't expect to be able to remove cells from a native niche and put them onto a very simple substrate and retain their native phenotype. So these cells are gonna change and there's gonna be a lot of artifact of cell culture where the cells are responding to being placed into a bizarre environment rather than any experimental conditions you're hoping to test. So when people are talking about cell culture, tissue regeneration, tissue engineering, regenerative medicine, et cetera, there's really three key components that we're talking about. And those are gonna be the extracellular matrix, the cells, and the soluble factor. The cells always get the most attention because typically they're the endpoint that we're looking at. The soluble factors also get a lot of attention partially because they're often the experimental condition and because it's easy to do iterative testing with soluble factors. The extracellular matrix really gets neglected, um, probably in large part because it's difficult to study, um, but also because it's so complex in the body and it's difficult to recreate ex vivo. However, it's really critical. When we look at this image of a cell in its extracellular matrix, we can tell that there is just tons of information exchange between the cell and its extracellular matrix. And we were taught from a very young age that cells are the basic building blocks of life. However, when you think about a human, you think about the number of cells that are in our body, they are really a small fraction of our mass and we're really mostly extracellular matrix. However, we neglect this component whenever we're studying regenerative medicine um, in general. And, you know, this is a striking image, but when we look at a cross section of the cell, it gets even. And so here we have a cell interacting with this extracellular matrix. And until I label it, it's actually really difficult to distinguish where the cell ends and the extracellular matrix begins. So this very, you know, thin dividing line going from the top left to the lower right hand corner of this image is the phospholipid bilayer. And you can see how information is being exchanged directly across the membrane um, and the cytoskeleton is interacting directly with the extracellular matrix. So this microenvironment is playing a critical role in determining stem cell behavior and determining stem cell fate. And this information exchange between matrix and cells just cannot be discounted. And what they did was they force cells to take on different shapes. And so the cell, the starting cells and the substrate was exactly the same. All they did was change the structural cues. And so by forcing cells to take on a different shape, they actually responded to the exact same stiffness of the substrate in different ways. And so the reason that this is important is that it shows how difficult it is to recreate the effects of the native matrix. Because in the native matrix, the architecture, the stiffness, and the biochemical cues are acting in concert to 
get certain function from cells. And we can't expect to recreate just a couple of these variables from the matrix and get native cell function. So I spoke a little bit about what traditional cell culture looks like. And I think it's important to emphasize here that really traditional cell culture evolved totally by accident. You know, it started out with people looking for hematopoietic stem cells and seeing that some cells, some subpopulation of cells from bone marrow stuck to the bottom of these jars. And then we evolved modern cell culture techniques from that. And we really haven't seen a whole lot of evolution in how we do cell culture over the last 60 years. And so we really see this Selvo matrix that we're producing, these cell-derived extracellular matrices to recreate the complexity of the natural microenvironment as the next evolution in cell culture. And so we try to turn the traditional paradigm of cell culture on its head. And rather than taking cells out of a native microenvironment, and putting them into these very simple foreign environments that cells are going to react to by changing. Instead, we like to take cells out of their native microenvironment, isolate these cells of interest, and put them right back into a normal cell-derived environment where they can behave as they would in the body. And the way we do this is that we take human cells, we put them into a tissue culture dish and allow them to grow to confluence. And then at confluence, we induce them to secrete a matrix. Once they've done that, we use a non-denaturing detergent to remove those cells, wash it thoroughly, and we're left with the cell-derived matrix intact at the bottom of the dish. And so this is an SEM image of uh, the Selvo matrix in the bottom of a dish. And when we sell it, it looks just like tissue culture plastic dishes. However, there's a thin film at the bottom, and that is this intact matrix. So all the end user has to do is add PBS or media to rehydrate the matrix for 30 minutes, and then they can wash that away and feed their cells. And so it works in their existing workflows. They can continue to use similar seeding densities and media products. All they need to do is use our plates, and they have this intact cell-derived matrix that's going to more closely mimic the native niches from which their cells came. So a lot of times people have trouble um, understanding exactly what this product is when I describe it. So I like to include these next few slides to help clarify this. So this is a very up close image of what the matrix looks like at the bottom of the dish. But you can actually visualize the matrix in Brightfield, and so you can see that it's kind of naturally aligned fibrils, um, and, but it does not interfere with imaging your cells on the matrix, so you can use Brightfield to see your cells on the matrix. And you can also do um, fluorescence microscopy. So on the left, we have an image where we're actually staining a matrix component. Um, and then on the right, we have cells being stained on the matrix. Um, those are endothelial cells. One key application of Selvo matrix technology is that it enables totally xeno-free isolation and expansion of primary cells. There's a few products out there that claim to work for this, but the reason that oftentimes that we have to use high serum culture conditions is that the serum you know, coats the bottom of dishes and makes it sticky so that we're able to isolate primary cells. Um, using the Selvo Xenofree matrix, we're able to completely replace our normal fetal bovine serum with just 2.5% human platelet lysate serum. And we're able to get better isolation and expansion of primary cells than any of the competitive technologies we're familiar with for um, when it comes to isolating mesenchymal stem cells. Um, we've seen a similar phenomenon with other cell types, and that data is not shown here. <laughs> now, I told you before that when you put cells onto a foreign environment, you can expect them to change. Now, I know that when you look at this graph, um, it's difficult to read any of these components over here, but what I, the takeaway that I want you to get right now 
is that when you seed cells on the Selvo matrix versus tissue culture plastic, you're going to see very different gene expression. And what we've observed consistently is that when cells are seeded onto tissue culture plastic, they immediately upregulate the structural and matricellular proteins that they're not seeing. And so, for instance, if you seed a mesenchymal stem cell or some other type of adult stem progenitor mature cell onto a fibronectin matrix, they may be expecting to see a whole bunch of different collagens and they're going to start expressing those. And one thing that we know that is you know, universal is that these gene expression changes don't happen in isolation. And so when these cells have to turn on, say, collagen 1 expression or collagen 12 expression or collagen 6 expression, there's going to be other changes to the gene expression patterns that are more difficult to predict. And so we believe this can be a major source of cell culture artifact, a major source of spontaneous differentiation, a major reason why it can be difficult to achieve uh, mature phenotypes that are similar to those found in cells in the body when we're doing cell culture. Um, and so by putting cells onto the Selvo matrix that better mimics their natural environment, they're able to keep gene expression that's more similar to what they're doing in the body. Now this graph here is actually a very interesting piece of data. And so on the x-axis, we have unique donors of bone marrow MSCs. And on the y-axis, we have cell doubling time. Um, and so consistently, we saw that cells grew faster on our matrix. But I'm not really concerned with that because I've always been of the opinion that if cells are growing slower in one condition, you can just give them more time and they'll catch up. However, what's very interesting about this graph is that on cell though matrix, cells from different donors had a much more consistent doubling time. And so this reminds me of a very interesting source of bias in both academic and industrial research. When you see this sort of variability in cells cultured on TCP, what happens is that in your lab, someone may thaw a vial of cells, and if they don't behave exactly as expected or desired in these really bizarre cell culture conditions that are our standards, then we tend not to thaw those cells again. So these cells up here, even though they're more than capable of proliferation, are probably not going to get thawed a second time. And they're going to end up sitting in a liquid nitrogen doer until some grad student comes along five years later, thaws them out. They don't work for them either. They don't thaw anymore. And then 10 years later, somebody wonders why they have cells from the 1990s, and they toss those out. And so we have this bizarre source of bias where we tend to only use cells that behave exactly the way we want them to in odd experimental conditions. So by giving cells a more natural environment, we're able to get more normal function across donors. And I think that can give us a better biologic representation in our in vitro experiments. And so most of the data that I showed you was from MSCs because our original product was developed with MSCs in mind. However, you know, we're frequently asked about other cell types, and we've used our Selvo matrix for many cell types, both in our hands and with our collaborators. And so below is a non-exhaustive list of cell types that we know grow well on Selvo matrix. So these are MSCs from various tissues of the body, uh, human islet cells, um, some but not all cancer cells, um, oocytes, cells involved in bone healing, chondrocytes, renal cells, endothelial cells, uh, monocytes and macrophages isolate very well on our matrix. Um, and then in general, we recommend Selvo matrix for use with mammalian adherent cells. I should also say that even though our products are made by human cells, they can be used with different species as well. And so we've had people use these with mouse, rat, um, 
marmoset, baboon, horse, uh, bovine cells. Uh, this is a non-exhaustive list, but just to give you an idea, there's been a whole lot of mammalian cells and even uh, um, avian cells have been cultured on these matrices. And so though most of the data I showed you is from bone marrow MSCs from humans, um, this is going to recreate some common motifs found in various cell niches that can result in more native phenotypes from many different cell types and from many different species. So in summary, Selvo matrix creates a natural protein-based environment for isolating and expanding adherent cells. Selvo matrix works well with a variety of cell types and in general what we see is both improved yields and improved phenotype retention and culture. The cells are responsive to growth factors when cultured on Selvo matrix are more responsive. Um, and Selvo cells and matrices fit into existing workflows. So this is an important thing to mention. You can detach cells the exact same way you currently do, use your same media, um, your same enzymes. This is just replacing your existing substrates. And then cells have a more native phenotype when cultured on Selvo matrix. So in general, what we do is we enable biologically relevant cell culture. Our current suite of Selvo products includes our original Selvo matrix and a Selvo Xenofree matrix, as well as we've recently added a suite of stem and progenitor cell products. And so we have adipose, bone marrow, and Wharton's jelly MSCs. We have human cord blood endothelial progenitor cells and uh, human chondrocytes. And one Im important distinguishing feature between our cells and those of other companies is that all of our cells that are cultured have only ever seen our Selvo matrices so that they've never been exposed to these really foreign environments that are gonna change their phenotypes. They're all early passage and they all come from healthy tissue. So there are groups out there that are you know, selling adipose MSCs that are isolating them from lipoaspirates of obese donors. It's a very inflamed microenvironment. So we're only getting these cells from healthy tissues. Um, all of our MSC products are entirely xeno-free and we also provide P0 chondrocytes, so freshly um, isolated and cryopreserved chondrocytes um, that have never been cultured. We're also very excited to announce a couple of new product launches coming very soon, our Selvo Matrix Plus. This is another cell-derived matrix that was designed specifically for pluripotent cell expansion. What we see with this matrix is that while it is much easier to use than competitive products, it results in comparable self-renewal of pluripotent stem cells However, it is better than competitive products for achieving mature phenotypes of differentiated progeny. So we think this is a very exciting project that we're excited to launch around the end of the summer. Another product that we expect out this summer is Selvo Chondro Matrix. Um, we recently published a paper in Active Biomaterialia about this matrix. And so even though I discussed how our Selvo matrix can work for a variety of cell types, we acknowledge that there are some tissue specific cues that may be important for specific cell applications. And so what we've done is we've made a matrix from articular chondrocytes, and we've seen that it has a very distinct structure and mechanical properties, as well as composition when compared to our um, first product, the Selvo matrix, and that while both matrices support the rapid expansion of human primary chondrocytes, the articular cartilage-derived extracellular matrix, or chondro matrix, results in cells that are capable of making a cartilage pellet that's really rich in COL2, low in collagen 1, rich in glycosaminoglycans, and these cells that are removed from the matrix maintained a really high collagen 2 to collagen 1 ratio, um, similar to what is found in chondrocytes in the body, as compared to cells 
expanded using traditional methods that really totally lose that phenotype. So this is another project that we're really excited about, and we think this product is going to have a big impact in orthopedic applications and orthopedic research for people studying chondrocytes. Lastly, I'd like to thank our distributors, um, Caltag Med Systems in Europe, Gemini Bioproducts and BWR in North America, Funakoshi in Japan, Solin Biosciences in South Korea, and AXT in Australia and New Zealand. If you don't see your distributor here, um, you can check on our distributor page on our website at www.stembiosis.com, which is also a great source of information on our products. Or you can email us directly at info at stembiosis.com and we'll try to get back to you quickly. Thank you again for your time and let us know if you have any questions about cell-derived matrices.